Matt Kibbe is president here at Free the People, an educational foundation using video storytelling to turn on the next generation to the values of personal liberty and peaceful cooperation. He is also the host of Blaze TV's Kibbe on Liberty, a popular podcast that invites you to think for yourself. During our interview in DC, we continue our conversation from Kibbe on Liberty to explore his origin story the song lyrics and hero's journey novel that inspired him to start Free the People. We also discuss my origin story of how my family of artists gifted me the experience of creative freedom within the defined space of our studio. Our show together highlights the beauty of bravery and how artists can lead by inspiration, not force. We reflect on examples of art versus authoritarianism around the world including in my mom's native country of Iran, where poets and musicians are targeted by the Islamic regime. Above all the displays of bravery and declarations of independence, there is something that much more precious. Hope. If every person on the planet has the capacity to embody art as a way of being, then we can co-create a more beautiful world. With Matt Kibbe, I'm Sienna May Heath, and this is Leaving the Left for Liberty. Matt, thank you for coming on my show. Yeah, part two. <laughs> part two. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about my origin story with Free the People and how kind of fluid and artsy I was when I started and how I've kind of evolved to a place that you have also been to of putting facts over feelings in some sense. And as I was reflecting on some of my early articles on our platform, I reread an article I wrote called My Declaration as an Independent. One of the comments that came through on that article was a very angry man who I could still appreciate, you know, and he said, you're not standing for anything. But you could tell I was standing for something. Yeah. I, um, it's, it's funny because I have been obsessed with um, what this, this struggle that we're going through, this tribalism, um, where you know I, I believe very strongly that the authoritarian left and the far right and the political tribes that they populate today is a very small percentage of where America is. Um, they dominate all the space and they make all the noise and, and people ultimately feel compelled, particularly when they vote, that they have to choose a team. But I think I think most of us um, are trending towards independence. And to me that doesn't it's not it's not an ideology so much as a personal philosophy is you know, I'd really like to think for myself. And I'd I'd really like to have an opportunity to work through these really complicated issues and and maybe even look at some facts but also process the world through my emotions because that's what humans do and so me to me like um the trend in voter registration particularly amongst younger people that they they're more and more registering as independents and that's just politics but i think um, the upside of technology and we could talk about the downsides but the upside is um we are all becoming radically more independent, meaning that we get to choose for ourselves. So we, um, I always use a, a fun example that's not necessarily profound, but I'm much older than you are. You can see my record collection right here. Um, this is not hipster records because people think it's cool to play records. I'm old enough that I used to curate my music by going to a record store and hoping that they had something that represented my weirder tastes in music. The music industrial complex decided for me whether or not I was allowed to listen to something. And um, young people today would find that to be the most alien of experiences because they, they have access to all of these music services that give them everything. You can go down to the very obscure long tail of the internet where Logan curates his music He's, he's so much weirder than we are um, when it comes to music. And so young people live in this, this radically independent world where they, they curate their own music, and that's really cool. So you don't have to listen to Taylor Swift if you don't want to. 
imagine what hell it would be if you had to listen to Taylor <laughs> Swift and only Taylor Swift. So, but think about that. Apply that to everything now because everything is radically democratized. Everything is, is curated based on, on individual preferences. Now there's all sorts of overlords trying to manipulate what we curate and that's the clash. But I, th I think it's really hard to stop people like you from starting to become independent. So it's, mm -hmm. it's about that. Um, the, so declaring independence is like step one. And, and maybe, it's not, maybe it's not a philosophical framework, but it's, it's what you were talking about on my show, like um, intellectual property. you like, you own your mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what it is. And I think that's, that's what gives me hope about what we're going through right now. I think we're in the middle of something. It's very messy. And we started off with these old um, top-down institutions telling us what to think. Um, it could have been the news. It could have been the universities. It could have been the government. Um, it could have been corporations. Whatever those top-down institutions were, they were like... And you sort of had to listen because you couldn't go and figure out everything for yourselves. And then everything became radically democratized where you could discover, hey, that politician's lying to me. Hey, that news, corporate news channel, that's not true. Um, and now the empire is striking back. They're trying to stop us, right, from learning and seeking ourselves. They hate the fact that you're an independent. Um, they want you to fall in line. And I think all of, all of the anger and strife and partisanship and all this stuff is is resultant of that our overlords don't have as much control over us um and i think it it goes to a beautiful place i you could also come up with a horrible scenario where it turns into a really nasty thing but i'm an optimist i think free people solve problems mm. and you gestured to your records which i think is really relevant to your origin story as i understand it it is um and, and by the way, why I think that culture and music and art is so profoundly important if we're trying to turn people on to ideas and values. Because I was um, 13, it's usually sitting on top, but I, there, I was 13 and, and I heard this really cool band um, in my, it must have been my middle school. And and it's a band called Rush, and it was very striking to me. Um, the guy's, um, Getty Lee's voice is, is a force of nature, and the musicians are insanely um, powerful, but um, technically um, not competent, but just am amazing at their craft. And I, I went to that record store I was bitching about earlier, looking for the record that I'd heard um, someone else playing, and I, they didn't have it, of course. They had the equivalent of Taylor Swift everywhere, the Captain and Tennille at the time. Do, do you know who this is? No. Uh, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't really want to know. Um, Logan knows Captain and Tennille. Muscat, Muscat Love, that stuff's beautiful. Um, so I, I settled for this other album, 2112, and I, I immediately was drawn to it because the cover art is just beautiful. It's an ominous red star. Um, took it home. Um, and what you used to do before you could pull down music on Spotify is you would, you would put it on the turntable and you'd probably lay on the floor and you'd listen and you'd read the liner notes. And um, first of all, the, the album's fantastic. Um, every, everything that I was looking for, very different than anything else like it then or now. But it was dedicated to the genius of Ayn Rand. And I didn't know who that was. Um, she had an interesting name, but I thought it was a dude. I'm like, who's that dude? <laughs> and I ended up uh, stumbling across one of her um, very short novels, Anthem, at a garage sale, a very beat up old copy. And I, I'm like, that's that guy. So I took it home, I devoured it. Um, it's actually, um, all of her stories are hero's, hero's journey stories. We we're talking about this. And this is about um, a is very relevant to what we're what we've been talking about for the last hour. It's about a dystopian future 
where priests in a temple dictate what you can think and do and what you can say. And, and he's, um, I'm actually conflating the rushed version and the, and the other version because 2112 is, is, is generously borrowed from Ayn Rand's novel. Um, and, and everybody speaks in the third person. You can't say I, you say we. And this one person discovers that he's an individual, that he controls his own mind. And he gets in a lot of trouble and he breaks free and he eventually um, sets off to create a free society. So I just love this, this novel. And um, I went down the rabbit hole and found all these books and started reading and, and developed um, a, a pretty um, intense passion for, I guess I would call it libertarianism. You might call it classically liberal. Something. 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 I'm intrigued by what you said, um, that we're in the middle of something. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. <laughs> That's okay. Um, what do, uh, on a deeper level, you know, along the lines of co-creation mm -hmm. and music and art and b human beings as beings of speech. We were talking about how what sets human beings apart is their speech and how speech can be a form of art. I mean, on a really deep religious level, some believe that in the beginning was the word. Mm -hmm. And perhaps more secularly, if we look at the 2020s and what really sparked, I think, um, kind of like that character in the Ayn, Ayn Rand book, um, what really sparked a movement of contemporary dissidents and whistleblowers was them lifting their speech. As a writer, I love the written word and I see a place for it. There's something, though, about speech that it's almost like singing. Where are you, you, you want to express your feeling and you want to be honest and true and good. But you also don't want to hold back. So there's that balance. And as we think deeper into this realm of co-creation, what do you think we're in the middle of? You know, you were you were talking about your mom's journey um, um, in the last hour, and um, I'm going to answer your question by by going back to Rand's personal story. I don't know if you know this about her, but she was um, um, a teenager during the Bolshevik Revolution, and she wanted to be a writer. She wanted to be an artist. She wanted a voice. And she decided, I don't think her family decided for her, but she decided that she could not do that in an authoritarian place. So she left everything, got on a boat, and, and arrived in America. Couldn't speak a word of English. Somehow became, within just a couple years, a screenwriter in Hollywood. So it's, it's a it's a story of of someone who was so obsessed with um, her right to create and her voice and was willing to suffer whatever the price was to get there um, and to me that that's incredibly inspirational and 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 what everybody that is a creator kind of goes through if you're any good at it um, you almost have an unhealthy obsession that you have to do it, right? You have no choice. Yeah, you can't stop. And that's where the most beautiful things come from. And it's very uncomfortable. It's very difficult. Um, emotionally, physically, whatever the price is you're paying to get there. Um, and, and those are the people that change the world. Um, and, and maybe most people aren't like that. Maybe they don't feel that need to do that. But I think there's a little bit of that in, in all of us. And with some people, it's so intense that they become um, leaders. And they're not necessarily mm -hmm. wanting... Most artists I know, like the really stubborn, grumpy ones, they're like, I don't really care what people think about my stuff. I'm just doing it. 
but but that attitude almost makes you a leader because you're not telling people what to think but you're putting your stuff out there and you're saying this this means something to me maybe it means something to you where we're going i get the sense is that those people those artists who step out and don't care what anyone thinks about their co-creations mm -hmm. those people could lead through inspiration rather than wielding corrupt power they could they could inspire with a pure power of art that could totally change everything in a world i can't even imagine but that's that's where i think we're going there's um there's a story that um i've known for a long time and it's it's a great example of this um the velvet revolution in the the former um soviet controlled czechoslovakia was inadvertently unintentionally started by an underground band called the plastic people of the universe and they were um i see that that um this is not an old album but a new frank zappa album that's sitting right here and plastic people of the universe um late 60s early 70s i believe um that is the name of a frank zappa song so you have this this czech band that was really into frank zappa and frank zappa is just a famous anti-authoritarian artist and come there's there's this thing called the Prague Spring where for reasons people don't fully understand there's an attempt at um, basically pushing back the authoritarianism of the Soviet Union and trying to establish basic uh, democratic values and allowing for free speech and one of the things they allowed for was music so the plastic people emerge as, as this um, very subversive but very popular underground band. Well, the Soviet tanks roll in, they crush the, the Prague Spring. Um, the band doesn't want to stop. Um, and they, they're not political. They, they said very explicitly, I, I, you know, for all I know, they were Marxist, but they didn't think about politics. And they kept playing. And it became more and more difficult to play because um, their fans would get arrested, they'd get beaten, um, they'd get disappeared, all of these, these things. Um, but, and eventually the government jailed the band itself. And that's what triggered um, Václav Havel writing these dissident pieces outside of the courthouse, literally and sparking this this thing called the velvet revolution and it was just it was that spirit we were talking about um the creative spirit that it's not political it's not ideology ideological i mean i i see very strong strains of of libertarianism in that but it's just anti-authoritarian you don't want the man to tell you what to do um that is why we probably both believe that that artistic integrity and creation is what drove you to be an independent. It's not a mistake or an accident that I was turned on by music and a novel. It wasn't it wasn't a book about economics. It was a it was a hero's journey about someone that that didn't want. Um, the priests and the temples to tell him what to think. You were led by inspiration. Yeah. Were there certain song lyrics that inspired you? At the time, um, that so the drummer from Rush was the guy who wrote the lyrics, and he was kind of a insanely well-read high school dropout. Um, and at the time, he was really into Ayn Rand, which is why he wrote this this this. Um, this particular album about a dystopian future where you couldn't think for yourself. Um, so like a lot of his lyrics were sort of spot on. Um, he wouldn't have been so proud of them later in his life because he, he, he got more complex and had many more sources. But like there's a, there's a Rush call, song called um, Something for Nothing. You don't get something for nothing. So that, like, that stuff 
was was very important to me but um i also like frank zappa and frank zappa's are lyrics are anything but inspirational they're just weird but weird is inspirational to me too yeah and and you mentioned my mom we are a family of artists my mom my dad and me and uh, you, you were you were also talking about how like you're not sure if everyone has it in them to be an artist you're not sure if everyone has it in them to step out as an individual which is one of the themes of my show here on leaving the left for liberty what motivates someone yeah. to do that in a time when it's quite controversial and maybe that's actually a timeless question because it's always been controversial to step out and i bring up my mom and my dad and me as a family of artists because I, I want to share with you what that means for us. We don't all use the same medium. My parents are primarily ceramicists, clay artists, and painters. Other mediums also come into play, and, and they actually play is a good word of describing it because um, sometimes I, I find myself saying that we grew up together, almost like children. We had a, a studio and a gallery just down the street from our house. And I was freer than I realized. I thought I was so sheltered, but she was sheltering me from the constructs of society. <laughs> and meanwhile, I did get my hands in clay. I loved it. I still, I still love to work that way. And I I now I, I garden and I get my hands in clay in another way and make beauty of the world and make meaning and prep food, which I recommend everyone do <laughs> for the times that might be ahead. And I write and I speak and I tell stories and that still makes me an artist. I've struggled with that. Sometimes I compare myself to other artists who seem in a way more prolific. Maybe they travel more. My parents and I travel with a certain stillness and a certain diversity that makes us all artists in a way of being that's really unique. And I'm very grateful for that. So I have to, I have to have faith that each person has the capacity to be an artist because if that's true, we can co-create a more beautiful world. You had uh, an advantage of mentors, parents that sort of taught you that just by being themselves, that creativity was a normal, expected thing to do. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking back to, and I, I, I know the history, but I don't know that anyone knows the full history, but um, Ayn Rand's parents were not creative. They, they, they thought she was a little weird with all the writing and, and book reading that she was doing. He was a business guy. Um, and she watched the, the regime steal her dad's business. But she, she, ha she had to figure that out for herself. So I think there must be, you know, part of it is, is tradition and, and what we see uh, the people around us doing. But there's something stronger than that. Like, you, c you could be raised in a non-creative environment and become an incredible creator. Um, so I think that's, that's part of what it means to be a human. Maybe this is what separates us from other animals, is our ability to think critically. And, and, and maybe, I think you're probably using it the same word, but like, creator, to me, invokes entrepreneurship entrepreneurship in the sense that um, you have this idea that you want to bring to life um, it might be an idea that's so unique that no one's really thought about it before and, and and you're stealing from all these traditions and you're you're mashing them up but there's something that's that's created it's it's fundamentally different it's never been there before um, and as an entrepreneur you you have to bring that to market in the in the broadest sense um not 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 to sell it but just to to bring it to other people 
And quite often, creators and entrepreneurs are ridiculed, ignored, mocked, laughed at, because most of the rest of us don't understand what they're trying to do. And eventually, not only do we understand what they're trying to do, we almost can't live without that thing that they, they brought to us. Um, and I, so this, this, this could apply to economics. I mean, you might, I might be talking about Steve Jobs, who insisted that his engineers make this phone with all these, he wasn't a technologist. He's just like, I, I want that button. And, and they're like, why do you need that button? We have no market research that shows that people give a damn about that button. And he's like, I don't care. Feelings over facts. Yeah, I don't care. Um, and you know, he, by all accounts, he was a total asshole about it. But he, you know, it's because I think sometimes when you're trying to push through a culture that has a set of expectations based on what happened in the past, um, you you got to be the weirdo. You got to be the dissonance. You got to like say something that makes people really uncomfortable. But that's that's cool. It that's, is cool. That's how that's how stuff happens. Yeah, and the this part of our conversation is is reminding me of my roots, particularly on my mom's side, of Iranian dissidents and poets. My grandmother was a poet, and the last poem she wrote was for me. I have that on on my wall. I I can look at it while I'm doing my show, actually. And I'm really humbled by my heritage and my, my family on both sides. And to really think deeply about my mom's side. All, all an Iranian has to do in that country is speak a subversive poem, write a truthful song, take their hair down and show how beautiful they look with their hair blowing in the wind. And then the game is over because the protest is so beautiful mm -hmm. that the ugly Islamic regime hates it because beauty is their target. Yeah. I think that's, um, that's a profound way of explaining the, the anti-human nature of authoritarianism because they, they hate beauty and life at least a life well lived is all about pursuing that right um, and unfortunately um, if you let people do that people discover that a life worth living doesn't include their one-size-fits-all brutally imposed uh, rules and so I, th I think that's it's a fundamental clash, and um, in some ways, I'm surprised that the Iranian regime has survived this long, and and maybe maybe it's on its last legs, and it's probably a combination of of the economic failures of of their of their brutal socialist system, but more importantly, it's about suppression of the human spirit. And that combination is so, so much that it forces people that were have put up with it. Like all of these, all of these people in the street and around today, um, they probably put up with it for a long time. So why are they out now? And and we talked about this earlier. I think part of it is that a brave young woman stood up first. She didn't know. Yeah. Well, yes. Incredibly brave. She was the breaking point though. Many brave young and old women and men and children stood up before her. What, when did, um, when, when did it start? And, and maybe you can't say because oh. in some ways it's been going on since 79. Right, well, In some ways, it started before 79, because the roots of ancient Persia are rooted in beauty, 
in a, in a way that's really like it's very artistic I mean there's like there's symbols of fire and lions and uh, what looks like an eagle on one of the main Zoroastrian flags I was telling you during your show that um, I've noticed there's like the common misconception that oh suddenly Iranian women want to become westernized no <laughs> um, they knew what freedom and creation was before our young baby country of America was even born So it's always been there. Yeah. And in my mother's lifetime, as I've experienced from more so from a distance, there's been this underground protest of beauty, or not protest of beauty, but it's a beautiful protest mm -hmm. of dancing and song and storytelling and women taking their hair down that's just a symbol you know that that's that's and that only really scrapes the surface in a way because people are so obsessed with that that i don't think they really understand how deep it runs and how deep it it runs in my family of three of my parents and me of this quiet protest which is precious and many people now we're only seeing and knowing the woman life freedom on the surface all these brave men women and children sacrificing themselves one after another and it seems there are more of them than there are of americans who are doing that and why is it that men women and children in iran can come together and chant woman life freedom and yet here in, a, in the U.S., all three of those words are so controversial. And they're whispered by, by many underground. And there's so few of us yeah. who will show why bravery is so beautiful and say what a woman is when life begins and what freedom means to each of us as individuals. There's... Um I was talking about this somewhat ancient story of, of the Velvet Revolution. And earlier I mentioned the student protesters in Hong Kong. Um, another story that we have told at Free the People um, along these lines is the, the Cubans rising up last mm -hmm. summer. And, and what's interesting about that story um, is, is art and music. Um, these, and, and Cubans have, have long suffered. A, they have a similar, different story, but, but similar fate as Iranians living under a totalitarian regime, um, economic privation. Um, Fidel Castro famously banned Western music, um, and there's still that tradition of censorship. So these um, Cuban artists um, collaborating with um, Cuban dissidents in Miami created this song, Patria Vida, um, um, which means country and life. And it was a protest song criticizing Castro's infamous phrase, um, uh, patria o morte, uh, country or death. And so think about what that means, right? So you're, you're either in line, you're going you're gonna to be with the, the government's program, or we're going to kill you. And that was, that was his mantra. I mean, that pretty much summarizes authoritarianism in a nutshell. So these guys made this song. It became massive because of technology, because of these things. Like everybody, you, even authoritarian regimes have a hard time blocking the internet. They try to shut it down. Um, and there's always a, a hack that free people find, or people that want to be free find. And it was that song that, that started this revolution in Cuba. And, and the musicians and at least 20,000 protesters are in jail now. They'll probably never see them again. But the revolution in that case was not toppling of the government, but a huge exodus of young people um, fleeing through Latin America, and, and they'll probably end up in the United States. Um, but it was a song. That's why they're afraid. Um, they're afraid of this stuff because, um, you know, my white paper is not going to start 
a massive protest in the streets of Havana. Sorry, it's not going to do that. Um, if I was a good enough musician, my song might do that. Um, you have to be optimistic about stories like this, even though there's, there's a lot of pain and suffering and, and death that comes from this. But at the same time, I'm like, you can't hold us down forever. You can't do it. Um, and the more brutal you get, the more people rise up against you. Um, and I hope that that's where we're at in Iran. I'm not an expert, but I, but I see the same pattern happening again and again. And, you know, the one thing that's different from, from the 60s or the 1860s or the 1500s is the democratization of knowledge that's provided by technology. However stifled it is, however, um, however they tried to punish people that are, that are on the Internet, um, you just can't stop it. Um, and that knowledge is, is dangerous. You can you can find beautiful things on the internet. <laughs> well, yeah, dangerous. It's not it's not all some, cat, it's yeah. not all cat memes. Um, <laughs> it's only about half. I mean, and I, I'm I'm pro cat meme to be likewise. Clear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, my entire Instagram feed is cats and beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there's a parallel between the theme of death and what you were saying about Cuba and the the chant that sparked the islamic revolution in iran in 1979 which as we just talked about was death to america yeah and uh i n i never actually would have imagined that that chant would be in the streets of oakland california here in the u.s but lo and behold in summer 2020 blm and antifa chanted it they brought that death here yeah it, um, yeah, that as you remind me of this, like I, I never thought about it in such a profound way, but it's, um, it, what, what breaks my heart is that, um, America is really an idea and all, all my, all my friends in all these countries. And I've, I, I have friends all over the world that, um, and including a friend from Afghanistan who was actually here last night. He had to, he had to flee. I thought that, yeah, yeah. I saw him. Um, yeah. For those of you who don't know, we had a Christmas party last night with all of our, our freedom friends. And uh, I wish um, that America, the idea, was more robust than having people in the streets of LA chant death to America. Um, and it's, it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. I think, I think we should probably live up to those values and, and obviously defend them against people that would, would trash the ideas of, of, of personal freedom and, and all the beautiful things that, that America has done. Um, we don't always live up to that. And I, all of my friends, no matter where they're from, will will tell me they've always told me um we always point to america as as an idea of what we should be and they're like anymore it looks like you guys are losing it too so if we don't have you we we don't have something to point to and that that's the that's the reason obviously that we do what we do at free the people because i think i think there's an upside this beautiful upside of, of liberating people and creating um, a a um, new movement of anti-authoritarian independence. Um, but if we don't do it, there's a lot at stake. So it's a it's a mostly happy fight, but it's a necessary fight. America is great, and I think if we lose the West, we lose the world. America is great because we have potential. And we have a lot of meaningful work to do. It's not great because, just simply because it is. Yeah. And 
That's why lately I've actually been straying a little bit you know, from the term of liberty and mm -hmm. thinking more along the lines of liberation, not liberation ideology, sure. but really what it means, the process. Yeah. We have to reckon with the slaughter of the Native Americans. Yes. We have to reckon with that trauma. I don't know how. You know, I interviewed two indigenous people, Tracy Bone and, and her friend on my show, on this show, when they were at the Freedom Convoy. They were actually in, to keep track in their of what car. Show this is. Yeah. yeah, I know. I'm like, wait, what show? <laughs> yeah, it all flows together. Um, and we, we, re we talked a lot about trauma. It was a very personal episode and conversation. And perhaps feelings don't care about your facts, at least not right now, because Americans have a lot of generational trauma that they need to work through. Oh. I, yeah, and I think we, um, and this is why I talk about America as an idea, and I, I find the, the words in the Declaration of Independence to be, be aspirational. This is, this is who we should be. Um, but we haven't always been there, right? And it's, so it's a process of, of getting closer to that ideal. It doesn't mean that we didn't make horrible mistakes along the way, absolutely. And, and we could do a whole show on the, all of those mistakes. Um, but that said, the idea to me is what's so powerful. That's beautifully said. Thank you. Thanks for doing this.